Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to your meeting. I'm really excited to hear your questions and to talk with you. Um, for those of you who uh, are on the phone or can't see me, um, I'm sitting in my, my home office. Um, I have a picture of a flower on the wall behind me. Um, I have brown curly hair and I wear glasses. Um, I'm going to talk with you today about Disability Rights California, the different types of um, advocacy services that we provide. Um, and then I also want to talk with you about the program I work in, which is the Client Assistance Program. So I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Um, and as we go through the, the presentation today, I really welcome your questions. I want to make sure that this training meets your needs. Um, so if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to, to put them in the chat box and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them as they come up. Um, the slide that I'm sharing has our Disability Rights California logo. Um, and now I'm going to share about um, the vision and mission statement of Disability Rights California. Um, our statement is that we envision a barrier-free, inclusive, diverse world that values each individual and their voice. In this world, all people with disabilities enjoy the power of equal rights and opportunities, freedom from abuse, neglect, discrimination, dignity, and respect for their choices based on their own goals and values. Disability Rights California advocates, educates, investigates, and litigates to advance the rights, dignity, equal opportunities, and choices for all people with disabilities. Um, Disability Rights California is California's protection and advocacy system. Every state in the country has an organization like ours, and it's called the Protection and Advocacy Agency. Um, in California, Disability Rights California is the agency that, that takes that role. Um, we were established in 1978 to protect the rights of people with disabilities. Um, and we provide our services based on a set of advocacy principles, an advocacy service plan, and we're able to provide these services through nine federal grants and two state grants. Um, because we receive funding from the state and federal government, we're able to act as independent advocates, um, which means that we are not employed by any of the agencies um, or, or state offices that we assist people in accessing services from. So we have uh, a lot of freedom to advocate for our clients without being in any situations where we have a conflict. So as I mentioned earlier, we provide advocacy, education, um, investigation, and litigation on behalf of people with disabilities. So I want to talk more about how we do that. Um, there's a photo on the slide that I'm sharing of a man holding a sign in front of the Capitol building that says, I or death, we can do more than you think. Um, and this is a photo that was taken from the Capitol Death Access Day. So in, in terms of our advocacy, we provide um, legal representation on an array of disability related issues. Um, disability Rights California um, tries to cover um, many of the agencies that someone with a disability might encounter um, within their lifetime and at different stages of life. Um, we also work to make policy changes that benefit many people. So we have a, a legislative unit that works in Sacramento um, and we try to uh, communicate with the leadership to make changes that impact um, uh, all of California. Um, we also advocate with different um, agencies uh, through our different practice groups, which I'll talk about soon, um, to make changes that affect people who receive services from a particular agency. Um, we help people who reside in state psychiatric hospitals. And we provide um, education services. So we do community outreach and training, um, which is like what we're doing today. 
We also provide clinic activities where rather than having people come to our offices to get services, we bring our services out to the community. Um, in light of COVID-19, these clinic activities look a little bit different. Um, but we continue to um, be fully operational, even though most of our staff um, are not attending in-person meetings or are working remotely. Uh, we provide counsel and advice to foster self-advocacy skills. Um, so if you contact our office through our intake line, um, which is 800-776-5746, you can speak to someone over the phone in the same day um, who will be able to answer your questions and give you some suggestions about how you might move forward with a particular um, concern or question you have uh, about disability related services. We also have a website where we have a number of publications and resource materials. And if we have time at the end of today's session, I'd love to give you all a tour of our website um, so you can find the things that you're looking for. The other things we do is in, in, uh, investigate and litigate. So I'll talk about our investigation activities. Um, and on this slide, I'm sharing a uh, photo of um, a protest in the Bay Area, and this was related to uh, accessible transportation. Um, and there is a person holding a sign in the, in the photo that says, Still We Rise. Um, and our, going back to our investigation activities, um, we investigate and address um, reports of abuse and neglect of dependent adults um, and, uh, with disabilities. Um, so this includes um, both physical abuse, neglect, but also financial abuse. We have a unit that um, does investigations for um, beneficiaries of Social Security who are not happy with how their representative fees are handling their money. Um, we also do monitoring in facilities and segregated settings. Something unique about the protection and advocacy systems is that we're able to go into um, locked facilities or places where the public isn't always able to go um, if we feel that uh, we need to uh, make sure that the, the folks in those settings are safe. We also litigate, um, which is a, a word that's used for filing a lawsuit or taking a legal action. Um, and so we advocate for people with disabilities and class actions, which is when there are many people um, involved in a, uh, a legal case. Um, and we also sign on to um, uh, lawsuits that are being enacted by other law firms that we support, and that's called an amicus work. So I just moved slides and now I'm showing a, um, a photo on this slide. Um, this photo is actually of me um, and a client, um, Ben Nugent, who um, attended our competitive integrated employment clinics, um, which we held in partnership with the Regional Center of Orange County and the Department of Rehabilitation. And he's receiving his certificate of completion and we're shaking hands in the photo. Um, the Competitive Integrated Employment Clinics were a seven-month-long um, information and training program um, where self-advocates attended and they learned how to access employment services from Department of Rehabilitation and Regional Center in order to get jobs that they wanted. And so, um, Disability Rights California has different practice areas and programs. Um, we cover a very broad range of legal issues, so we have different teams of staff that have expertise in different areas. Um, so we have a civil rights practice group, a health, home, and community-based services practice group, um, and that practice group helps people with things like in-home supportive services and other services that people need in order to live in their homes. We have an intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities practice group. We have a team that works on mental health issues. We have a practice group called the Pathways to Work. That's the um, practice group that I work in. And uh, my practice group focuses on employment, 
um, for clients and applicants of Department of Rehabilitation, Independent Living Centers, um, and other Rehab Act funded programs. And we also have another grant within our practice group that helps people who receive Social Security benefits to remove barriers from work. And those could be barriers that are related to their benefits, or it could be things like needing reasonable accommodations or other types of um, assistance in order to allow that person to pursue employment. We have a voting rights practice group. We also have a youth and special education practice group. Um, we have a unit that works um, with on uh, advocacy for clients of the regional centers. And that unit is called the Office of Clients' Rights Advocacy. And everywhere there's a regional center, there's also um, a clients' rights advocate um, who serves the clients of that regional center um, to be able to understand their rights and access the services that they need. We have a peer advocacy unit, um, and that's the unit that will be joining you um, uh, in a few, in a, uh, I believe next week, Judy said. Um, and that unit is people with disabilities that teach um, all kinds of skills to other people with disabilities. Um, we also have a unit that looks at um, investigations of abuse and neglect. So as I mentioned, the way to access our services is to call our intake line. Um, in order to decide which people we represent um, and which people we provide advice to, we have what's called a case acceptance criteria. And so if we're in deciding whether or not to represent a client, we'll look at the merits of the case. And that means, um, is there a legal argument that we can make to help the person support their request? Uh, with the client's ability to advocate for themselves? So many times people call our office and we can give them suggestions to help them to solve a problem on their own. Um, or to be able to take the next steps they need to to get the services and tools that they're seeking. Um, we also uh, look at whether or not there are other advocacy sources available, um, whether or not the problem that someone's calling about is one of the DRC priorities, and those are listed in our advocacy service plan on our website, and if we have the resources to help. Um, I can say I would love to take more cases uh, than I do, but there's only one of me and often many people seeking our assistance, so sometimes they just, our office doesn't have the resources to rep represent everyone who contacts us. So um, I would like to pause here and see if anybody has any questions. Um, you're welcome to submit those in the chat box and I can try to respond to them now. Yeah, you, you have quite a few, um, Rebecca. So okay. a, a few people that were rejected for SSI and disability. Um, so you have plenty to, to deal with here. Okay, I can't find the chat box. Okay, I, let, me, let me read some <laughs> to you to get us started. Okay. Um, one person, uh, just got rejected from S for SSI a few days ago. It's a 21-year-old uh, son who has Asperger's, and they want to know what to do next. How do they appeal their decision to be successful? Okay, so um, I want to explain the, the types of Social Security issues that, that we can help with, and that might answer many of the questions. Um, so uh, under our um, uh, Protection and Advocacy for Beneficiaries of Social Security Grant, or for short, we call it PABS, um, we represent people who are benefits recipients who um, are experiencing um, barriers to work. And our role in that advocacy is to try to help them remove those, those barriers so that they can work. Um, we do not represent in what's called an establishment case um, or the initial case to start receiving your benefits. Um, so if it's an eligibility issue, um, our grant doesn't allow us to do that type of advocacy, but we do have referral lists available. So if you are experiencing um, 
difficulty with the, the application process, um, you can contact our office and we're happy to provide you with a referral to other agencies that help people become eligible for benefits. Do you know any of those off the top of your head, Rebecca? Um, I don't, but I'd be happy to email you the referral list if you'd like to share it um, with the support group. Okay, and just so people know, anecdotally, when we had Jim Hayek, who's an advocate for people trying to secure benefits, he said it's very common to get rejected multiple times before you receive it. Um, so uh, I don't know, it, it won't make you feel any better because it's got to be very frustrating, but um, just so you know, that is pretty pretty common, but I think it would be helpful for them to know who, who they can partner with because it's very frustrating and, uh, and I'm sure they could use help. And if you are a client of the regional center, um, you may be able to ask your service coordinator if they can assist you um, in that process, um, but I will provide a, a referral list that can be shared with the group for um, what we call establishment cases. Okay. Um, I'm looking through here. Okay, there's just more information about the person who um, applied but didn't did not receive it. Do you work? Do you, okay, good. <laughs> Um, yeah, there was somebody else who, who, who was denied disability, which I assume would be this, in the same category that you're saying that uh, you don't get involved in. Do you get involved in, with schools in terms of, we've had some people, there was one parent who has a son who has autism, he also has Tourette's, but he's in honors classes, and so they're refusing to provide him with uh, an IEP. So do you get involved with uh, people that are having trouble within the school system? Um, we do have uh, a number of self-advocacy um, publications on our website um, that are put together by our youth practice group, um, which focuses on special education issues. Um, so we do um, look at special education um, and have a team of staff that work on those types of issues. Um, I can tell you the exact question you're asking is one of the questions in our special education rights and responsibilities manual. Um, so towards the end of the session, I'll give you a tour of the website and let you know where to find that and making some notes for myself as we go along. Okay, I'm looking to see. All right, so the, the two questions we got were about SSI and SSDI. So um, why don't you continue and hopefully more questions will appear as you progress. Okay, great. Um, so the, the next topic I am going to talk about is the program that I work in, um, and this is called the um, client Assistance Program, and the Client Assistance Program provides information, advice, um, and advocacy to people with disabilities who are trying to access services from the Department of Rehabilitation, Independent Living Centers, and other programs that are funded under the Rehabilitation Act. Um, in addition, CAP advocates can help protect the rights of people with disabilities um, by providing information and advice about uh, the ADA in terms of employment. Um, so we, we do provide trainings and counsel and advice on how to access um, reasonable accommodations in the workplace. The, the CAP program was established to improve communication and help resolve issues between clients and um, DOR or vocational rehabilitation staff. Um, so if a person encounters any um, questions, problems, concerns along the way, they're welcome to, to give our office a call. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're independent advocates, so I don't work for the Department of Rehabilitation. 
um, which allows me to be um, a zealous advocate for my client um, without having any conflict in my advocacy. And um, depicted on this slide is um, one of our CAP advocates um, and a client um, and his mother, and they're all standing in a row. The, the former client is Andy Lim. Um, and he is uh, one of the recipients of our um, Client Recognition Award um, for his self-advocacy in transitioning from sub-minimum wage employment uh, to competitive integrated employment. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about what those um, words mean. So in the CAP program, uh, we provide information to the public uh, we provide counsel and advice and support to help people with health advocacy. Um, we represent individual clients um, in resolving disputes. Um, sometimes that's by sending a phone, uh, an email or making a phone call on someone's behalf. Um, but that could be all the way up to representing someone uh, in the appeals process, um, including at their hearing. Um, we also do a lot of systemic advocacy. So we work with state leadership um, and the Department of Rehabilitation to try to make changes that um, improve people's access and, and quality of services. And we have several commitments within the CAP program. Um, one is to resolve um, issues at the lowest level possible. So generally our advocacy begins with a phone call to the DOR office um, and many times we're able to resolve um, concerns just by uh, speaking with a counselor or another DOR staff member. Um, we also uh, work within the Rehabilitation Act policies and principles and those are to empower individuals with disabilities to maximize employment, economic self-sufficiency, independence and inclusion um, and integration into society. Um, we also have principles at, at DRC about um, how we do our advocacy. And those are, um, I'm just gonna read a, a small excerpt from it. Um, so we do what the client wants, not what others want or what we think is best. We are honest about our limitations, values, resources, and the likely outcome. The client chooses the outcome and the method of achieving the outcome. So I'll translate that. Um, we listen to our clients um, about what they want and how they would like to get there. Um, and the client's choices will be treated with respect. The client actively participates in every stage of the process. Um, so we see this advocacy model as um, a way to not only help people towards their goals, but also to really empower people um, in the process to, um, you know, pursue the things that they need and that they want, um, and to give them the tools to be able to do so more independently the next time a, a problem arises. Um, so in order to get services from the CAP program, um, you have to be a person uh, with a disability who has received, um, is receiving, or needs services through the Department of Rehabilitation, Independent Living Centers, or other Rehabilitation Act funded programs. Um, or um, we do get many calls from people who would just like information about um, what types of employment services might be available to them as a person with a disability. Um, our um, information that we provide through our program is very broad. Um, and, and also the appeal rights for um, recipients of these programs are very broad as well. So uh, a DOR client can appeal any action or inaction by the DOR that they disagree with. Um, so we get calls about all kinds of things um, and all of those issues are um, important to us. Rebecca, can I ask you yeah. a quick question? Um, are independent living centers, that's not places where people live, those are facilities to help people establish independent living skills? 
That's correct. So the independent living centers are a very cool organization. Um, they actually have a mandate that um, I believe, uh, I could be wrong, but I believe it's 51% of their employees have to people with disabilities. Um, and those um, individuals uh, assist other community members in being able to live in the community um, in the most integrated um, uh, ways possible. So um, independent living centers provide a variety of information and services to help people with housing, um, independence, uh, assistive technology. Um, services vary from center to center. Um, but it's a very cool organization. Um, and in Orange County, the independent living center is the Dale McIntosh Center. Mm. Okay, thank you. Sure. And I'm going to go ahead and pause here and take a look at the chat box and see if there's any questions about the CAP program. Could you tell us, uh, I don't see anything yet, but could you tell us some of the types of um, advocacies or uh, situations that you help people with as part of this service that might um, help people understand the value they could get? Absolutely. So all of the, the clients that you've seen in the photos of the, the presentation thus far are, um, are clients who receive services from the CAP program. Um, and Thank you for the reminder to describe the, the image on this slide. Um, this is a um, young woman in a red cap and gown, um, and her name is Irene Short. Um, she's a person with autism, and she had contacted our office um, for assistance in, in developing her individualized plan for employment, um, which is a, a plan that um, clients work on with the DOR about their employment goals and the services that they'll receive. Um, in Irene's case, um, she wanted to develop an IPE with the goal of film production. And there was some concern about her ability to uh, attend college. Um, so the photo you see here is um, one that she sent us when she had completed her associate's degree and was getting ready to transfer um, to a four-year university. Um, so within our advocacy, we were not only able to help her um, to get the employment goal that she wanted in her plan, but we also assisted her in getting the services that she needed, like tuition, books, supplies, transportation, um, and other services to help her be a successful student on her path to employment. Um, and I do see there's a question in the chat box about Cal Able. Um, so we do have some resources on our website about Cal Able, um, and we can provide advocacy related to Cal Able um, if it is to remove a barrier to work. Um, but otherwise, we would provide um, general counsel and advice um, about the the program itself. So are there any questions about um, the client assistance program? Doesn't look like it. Okay. I'm going to switch topics again. Um, you'll notice every time there's a blue slide, I'm switching gears. Um, so I'm going to talk um, now and for the rest of the training um, about the competitive integrated employment and the types of services that help people to obtain um, competitive integrated employment in the community. So competitive integrated employment is essentially um, real jobs for real people uh, with real wages in the real world. Um, and so there's a, a definition for competitive integrated employment that is um, defined in a, a law that's called the Workforce Innovations and Opportunities Act. Um, and it describes competitive integrated employment as a job where a person makes the same amount of money as someone without a disability who's doing a similar job, and it has to be at least minimum wage. So um, uh, if you have um, two people who are both bakers, and one of them has a disability and the other one does not, um, the WIOA says that both people should make the same amount of money if they're doing the same work. 
um, in competitive integrated employment. Um, individuals also get their paycheck from a regular um, employer as opposed to from a service provider. Um, people working in competitive integrated employment have opportunities to interact with customers, clients, and other coworkers um, with and without disabilities in the same way that someone working in a similar job would if they did not have a disability. Um, so if you have two people um, who work in the same type of position, um, it wouldn't be competitive integrated employment if a person with a disability um, is only on a shift with other people with disabilities or um, has to work in the back of the, um, the warehouse um, where there aren't other people to interact with, um, or they don't get to talk on the phone with customers. Um, so unless the person is electing that as a way to customize their job, um, people with disabilities should have the same access to the community as people without disabilities. Um, the law also says that um, people with disabilities should have the same opportunities for benefits and promotions as a person without a disability. Um, so what that um, might look like is if, um, uh, you know, if you're working in what we would call contract employment and your employer is a, a service provider, um, then you're not able to have the same benefits as other employees. Um, and you may not be able to receive promotions or become a supervisor if the supervisors are always people without disabilities and the employees are always people with disabilities. And competitive integrated employment can be full-time work or part-time work, and it can also be self-employment. Um, so there is a question in the chat box about at what point do we apply for CAP and how is the process different than DOR? So I'm going to talk about um, when you uh, can apply for DOR and what the eligibility criteria are in just a moment. So if I don't fully answer your question, please let me know. Um, but you can contact CAP at any point in time. Um, you can be a client, an applicant, or just have questions about Department of Rehabilitation Services and contact our office. So on this next slide, I want to share um, what competitive integrated employment looks like. I'm hoping that my video will work. Um, so here's a little video um, that we have put together. Um, so this is actually two former DRC clients um, who transitioned from sub-minimum wage employment to competitive integrated employment. Um, one of them works in a hair salon and the other one um, works in a restaurant. Um, and we interview them and follow them through their day. Um, so it's a great short video if you're interested in, in checking that out after the training. Integrated competitive employment can be for you. This is Andrew. Andrew uses a phone app as a tool to help him throughout the day of work. Here you go, the start of your work day. Don't forget, when you unlock that door, put those keys back in your fanny pack. Andrew, Nintendo. Where do you work? How long have you worked here? I'm here. Three years? Yes. So what do you do here? Here, um, blah, blah, gum, um, then it's all. Andrew's job duties at Dita Salon are to make sure everything is nice and tidy. Andrew would clean the sink, mop the floor, clean mirrors, wash and dry towels, and anything else that would help around the place. So is it fun talking to people at work? Yes. Yes. Are you getting paid for working? Yeah. Yeah, Jack. Money. What do you do with the money you make? Oh, buy a toy for the game. Oh, and that's make you happy, right? Yeah, yeah. Good. Thanks. 
This is Charles. Charles works at Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor. Hi, I'm Charles McCarran. I work for Farrell's Ice Cream. Uh, it's an ice cream and a restaurant. And I paid for the job. Um, I went and saw the ad on the on the fence, and I go, maybe this will be a good job for me. And put my application in. And two in two weeks, I got hired to work for him. Getting ready to clock in for work because I got to get the dish all caught up, get it ready for today's work and everything. And I'll show you how I clock in and everything. What are your job duties? I was, uh, I started out to be a dishwasher and now they move me up to prep and I do a lot of other jobs around the restaurant. What's prep? Means you get the food ready for the next day. Do you get to meet customers? Sometimes I do. Do you have other duties? Like, uh, like it's real slow, I go and do prep and then when it's like really slow, I got, I help do pizzas, help to clean the kitchen up. And uh, when it's really busy, I go and help the other dishwashers. This is my prep area. Sometimes I like do baking, like get baking ready. Uh, sometimes they need bread then, maybe bread, butter the bread, stuff like that. What would your message be for others who never work? You could just give a message. Just ask questions. That's what I do. I just ask questions. What stuff needs to be done? Be trained for it. Train and be real happy. But be real happy. If you get confused, just ask the boss to help you. And don't be scared of your job coaches. That's what your job coaches are there for to help you out, not to help you to learn the jobs better. Um, I really love that video because both employees are, are so happy in their jobs and they're interacting with all of their co-workers. Um, I particularly like Charles' story. Um, he shares about how he started out as a, a dishwasher and now he's been promoted since working there. Um, and uh, both clients are able to um, use the, the money that they earn um, to purchase things that they want. And, and that really increases um, quality of life for people in many different ways. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go back to the presentation. <laughs> um, so a, another component of competitive integrated employment um, that uh, is important is that as a a person with a disability, there are certain protections that you have um, against working in sub-minimum wage employment. So sub-minimum wage employment is typically employment where you make less than minimum wage, and the way that your wages are calculated is based on how much work you can do um, in, a, in an hour compared to someone without a disability. Um, what's important to note is that um, you know, this is the uh, people with disabilities are the only people whose wages get calculated this way. Um, you know, in, in all other types of settings, people usually get a competitive wage or an hourly wage based on the type of work they're doing, not necessarily how much work they're able to do in an hour. Um, so I'll just speak for myself. Um, you know, when I start my work day at 8 o'clock and I'm still drinking my coffee, um, I may not be able to do as much work in that first hour as I may be able to do around 10 o'clock when I'm ready to go and my brain's turned on. Um, so it's, uh, you know, not necessarily the best way to calculate someone's um, earning capability if we're looking at what they can do in a given hour. Um, but there are lots of ways to learn about the different opportunities and the options you have for employment. Um, the Department of Rehabilitation um, has some responsibilities um, to provide information to people who work in sub-minimum wage employment, and that um, training that they do is called Career Counseling Information and Referral. Um, and if you work in sub-minimum wage employment, um, it has to be provided to you at least annually and twice a year um, for your first year. It should be, or it must be um, provided to you in a way that's understandable to you. Um, so different people understand information in different ways. 
Um, so if you have a particular way that you receive information, um, you should be able to receive the, the um, training in that form. Um, and it can include information about benefits counseling. Um, there are many people who are concerned that they will lose their benefits if they work. Um, and so um, that is most of the time not true. Um, most people can uh, be earning much more money um, and there's lots of programs to help people retain their Medi-Cal and other um, uh, healthcare options if they want to try working. Um, and so the Department of Rehabilitation can share that information with you. Um, they should share it if you ask for it, um, but it should be provided in your career counseling information and referral. So um, before the Department of Rehabilitation can refer someone to subminimum wage employment, there are certain steps that they must take. And so there's a chart on this slide that's kind of like a flow chart with different um, hanging arms. And so I'll describe what it says here. Um, it says non-competitive integrated employment settings are prohibited for um, people who are under the age of 24 years old, unless, and then there's one arm um, off to the left and it says you have have a subminimum wage job before June 22nd, 2016. Um, so if you were working in subminimum wage employment before 2016, um, the, the law says you can stay there if you choose to. Um, but the next hanging arm off is that um, you should receive annual career counseling uh, about your options to be able to leave subminimum wage employment. Um, on the other side, so for folks who were not working in subminimum wage employment before June 2016, um, the DOR has to provide you with what's called pre-employment transition services, um, which we'll talk about more, um, the career counseling information and referral training in order to assist you in achieving competitive integrated employment. Um, and then, you have to have also applied for DOR services. Um, so if you applied for DOR services and were found not eligible, um, at that point, the DOR may refer you to um, subminimum wage employment. Or if you have questions about your eligibility determination, you're welcome to contact our office and we're happy to look at that and talk with you about other options. Um, or you were eligible for DOR services. The DOR um, provided you with services um, over a sufficient period of time and the services were very appropriate to your needs and your goal, um, but still you were unable to obtain competitive integrated employment. So what this all means is that the Department of Rehabilitation should exhaust all of the tools that they have in their toolbox before they refer anyone to subminimum wage employment. Um, so the, the Department of Rehabilitation has two different types of services that they can provide to help um, job seekers to obtain employment. Um, the first one that we'll talk about is pre-employment transition services, and the second one is vocational rehabilitation services. Um, but before I delve into those, I want to ask if anyone has any questions about competitive integrated employment. I'm all set up. <laughs> so uh, now I'm going to talk with you about pre-employment transition services. Um, as I mentioned before the video, this is one of the, the two categories of services that um, people receive from Department of Rehabilitation. Um, so under the, the law that I referenced earlier, the Workforce Innovations and Opportunities Act, or WIOA, um, the DOR has an increased role in transition. And transition is the process that we all go through as we um, move from being high school students into whatever our plans are after high school. Um, so the DOR uh, has to work with other agencies in transition-related activities. 
and they must attend IEP, which is the special education meeting, um, when they're invited, and they can be invited by um, a student, a parent, or the school district, or really any member of the IEP team. Um, and they also um, must attend the IPP, which is the planning meeting with the regional center for anyone who receives um, Medi-Cal or is Medi-Cal eligible um, if they are invited to those meetings. And I've included on this slide a little note, I know many of these meetings um, during uh, the pandemic are happening over the phone or virtually. Um, the DOR may attend those meetings in those formats as well. So pre-employment transition services um, are provided to uh, anyone who is um, meets the criteria. So um, those are that you're between the ages of 16 years old and 21, all the way up to the day before your 22nd birthday. Um, you are in an educational program, um, meaning you're going to school of some kind. Um, so it could be you are in high school, um, you may be attending a public school, a charter school, a private school, um, maybe you're taking some classes at a community college or in some other educational program. Um, and you're someone who is receiving special education or related services, or um, are a person who would be uh, eligible for a Section 504, uh, which is a reasonable accommodations plan. Um, whether or not you're receiving that, those services at that time. And there are five types of pre-employment transition services. And on this slide, there's a circle um, with different colors to represent each of the five services. Um, so the first that I'm going to talk about is um, job exploration service, or I'm sorry, job exploration counseling. Um, and so job exploration counseling um, is, uh, you know, opportunity to speak with uh, someone for information about what your options are in terms of employment um, and how, what are opportunities to figure out what you like and what you don't like, um, you know, in the, the workforce. Um, there is also work-based learning experiences, um, which may include in-school or after-school opportunities or experience outside of a traditional school setting, including internships um, that are provided in an integrated environment and take place in the community to the maximum extent possible. Um, the DOR can also provide counseling opportunities for enrollment in comprehensive transition to post-secondary education programs. So what that means is um, that they can provide information about attending um, school after you graduate from high school, um, including vocational education programs, um, college, university, and others. Um, the DOR can also provide workplace readiness training to help individuals develop social skills and skills for independent living um, that will help prepare them for life after high school. Um, the DOR uh, must also make available instruction in self-advocacy, and this includes instruction in person-centered planning. Um, it can include uh, peer mentoring, and uh, mentoring of individuals um, who are interested in working in competitive integrated employment. But even though there are five different types of services, um, some people may receive one, some people may receive all five, um, but they must be made available to um, students with disabilities. So how to get pre-employment transition services, um, which are also known as pre-ETS, a little shorter and easier to say. Um, so all that is required to get the um, pre-employment transition services, which um, in California, the, the UR tends to refer to these as student services, is you fill out a form and ask for them. Um, so on this slide, I've included a link to where you can find the form online. Um, the, on the same page, there's also um, a link that has your 
um, school district liaison. Um, so almost every school district has a liaison with the DOR. So if you're interested in um, contacting that person and asking questions about services, you can. There's an email um, address here where you can email youth services at dor.ta.gov um, to ask questions or get information about services. Um, you can also visit the DOR office near you to request services. Um, in these times, I will note that um, the DOR suggests that before visiting an office, you call in advance. Um, they do still have offices open, um, but they may need to prepare for your visit. Um, and they also want to make sure that you can access the building since many buildings are closed due to COVID-19. So if you're visiting an office, it's a good idea to call ahead. Um, on this next slide, I want to go over some myths about um, pre-employment transition services. Um, so these are calls and, and things that, that we hear as CAP advocates that we want to make sure you're armed with the facts about. Um, so one myth is that you have to ask for pre-employment transition services at your IEP or your school district special education meeting. So as we just talked about, um, you do not have to wait for a referral or ask for those services at your IEP meeting or for your school district. You can request them directly through the DOR um, in any of the ways that we just talked about. Another myth is that only students who are high functioning, quote unquote, um, can participate in pre-employment transition services. Um, so that is actually the opposite of the intent of um, WIOA. Um, WIOA uh, focuses pre-employment transition services to help um, young people to have more opportunities for competitive integrated employment and have less um, students with disabilities um, being transitioned into sub-minimum wage or segregated employment settings. So the priority for pre-employment transition services is to serve the students with the most significant disabilities and not the other way around. Um, another myth is that if you need a job coach or other general vocational rehabilitation services or supports, that you cannot get pre-employment transition services. Um, so this is also um, a myth. Um, you can receive pre-employment transition services and vocational rehabilitation services at the same time. So if you're a student with a disability and you'd like to participate in a work experience that you would need a job coach, um, you can apply for vocational rehabilitation services and receive the job coach through the vocational rehabilitation program while you receive the uh, work experience through pre-employment transition services. Um, there's lots of other examples of supportive services that may come up, but the same rules would apply. You can get both streams of services at the same time. Um, another myth is that if a student obtains employment as a result of a work experience, the student is no longer eligible for vocational rehabilitation services. So I want to point out um, that there is a different goal in each of these um, service categories. The goal of pre-employment transition services and work experience is to help young people explore um, working and different job opportunities. The goal of vocational rehabilitation services is to help people maximize their employment. So for many people, your first job may not be your dream job. It may also not be the job that you end up or the field that you end up having a career in. So you can be working um, and also apply for vocational rehabilitation services to help you get the job or career that you want down the line. Um, another myth is that students have to choose between um, school district services, regional center services, and pre-employment transition services. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, WIOA says that all of these agencies have to work together. So you can receive services from lots of different agencies um, uh, and still be eligible for different programs. The only thing is uh, two agencies uh, can't provide you the same service at the same time. So, you know, essentially no double dipping, but other than that, agencies can collaborate and work together um, in order to make sure that your needs are met. 
I'm going to pause here and take a look at the chat box um, and welcome you to ask any questions you may have about pre-employment transition. And I don't see any questions on my end. Um, I don't as well. Okay. So I'm going to move on, um, but you're welcome to still ask questions if you need to. Um, and now I'm going to talk about vocational rehabilitation services. So um, these are another type of service, uh, category of services that the Department of Rehabilitation provides. And the purpose of the vocational rehabilitation program is to help people with disabilities um, to prepare for work, to get a job, to keep a job, or advance in employment. Um, the state um, vocational rehabilitation program is not intended um, to just help people get jobs that are at the entry level. Um, I'm going to read to you something that was in a policy directive from the Rehabilitation Services Administration. And it says the state VR services program is not intended to solely place individuals with disabilities in entry level jobs, but rather to assist eligible individuals to obtain employment that is consistent with their unique strengths, resources, priorities, concerns, and capabilities. Um, so it's not necessarily about the first job that's available, but really about the job that you want and that is a good fit for you. Um, so you have a lot of choice and uh, it is a very individualized program where you should really be the star of the show um, and the guiding force of all of the planning process. So in order to be eligible for vocational rehabilitation services, which I'll call VR services, um, you have to be a person with a disability who has difficulty finding, keeping, or advancing in employment, and you have to have a need for services or support. Additionally, um, the DOR uh, has to, you would have to be someone who can benefit from DOR services in terms of an employment outcome. So what that means is if the DOR used all the tools in their toolbox, um, that it is likely that um, you would benefit from those tools by being able to get a job, keep a job, or advance in your career. Um, the law says that the DOR has to apply what's called a presumption of eligibility which means they should think that everybody is eligible unless there is what's called clear and convincing evidence that someone cannot get employment even if they provided all the tools in their toolbox. Um, and in order to reach that conclusion, they have to do very specific assessments. Um, and my experience uh, in CAP is that when someone's found not eligible for uh, DOR services, most of the time, the, the right types of assessments um, with the right services and supports haven't been provided. So if you apply and you're found not eligible, um, that would be a great time to give CAP a call um, because we can help look at your documents um, and let you know uh, how we can assist you or what your options are um, for seeking services. Um, the, DOR has several types of information that they can consider um, when determining if someone is eligible for services. So the most important is information that you um, or your family member, if you've chosen to have a family member participate or another representative um, provides to the DOR. Rehabilitation counselors can also make observations about disabilities that are apparent or visual. Um, so for example, um, if, if someone uh, is an amputee, so let's say they're an amputee of the arm, the DOR doesn't need to send that person to a medical evaluation in order to determine they have a disability. Um, the counselor can make an observation based on the appearance. Um, the DOR can also consider medical records um, or educational records or information from other agencies like Social Security, school districts, and the regional center. Um, if you are applying for DOR services and you have records already, 
that you agree with and you feel are an accurate uh, picture of you and your abilities, it's a good idea to bring those with you when you apply. Um, that can help speed up the application process. Um, additionally, the DOR can only ask you to participate in new assessments if they don't have enough information already. So if you have information that you can share, often that's helpful to streamline the eligibility process. There are um, several steps in applying for VR services. Um, the first is the application. And within 60 days of the day that you apply for services, the DOR should determine if you are eligible. Um, there are some circumstances where they can extend that timeline, but only if it's um, something they couldn't anticipate and it's outside of their control, and you agree to extend the timeline. Um, after you apply for services and are, are found eligible, the DOR has 90 days to meet with you and develop an individualized plan for employment. Um, that's your plan with the DOR about what your goal is and what your services will be. After you and the DOR sign the, the plan, you can start receiving services. Um, and once you have found employment, the DOR will monitor your employment until it is stable um, for at least 90 days, um, and it could be longer in some cases. And then at that point, they would close the case successfully employed. Um, if you need help after your case is closed, um, if it's been closed for a, less than a year, you can come back to the DOR without having to reapply for services and ask for post-employment services to help you keep your job. So some examples of when someone might encounter this is, um, you know, I got a job with the DOR, they closed my case, but now my employer is asking me to work remotely on this weird computer system and I need some assistive technology or it's not working for me. Um, so someone may call their counselor and say, I need some support in maintaining my employment. Um, or someone gets a promotion or they get transferred and now the work environment or tasks have changed and they need some services to stabilize employment. Um, so as long as it has been less than a year, you can ask for post-employment services um, without having to reapply. If your case is closed for any other reason, you can reapply for services at any time. Um, so if I, my case was closed with the DOR today, um, and I needed help tomorrow, I could reapply for services then. Um, there is an application for Department of Rehabilitation Services. It's a one-page form, um, and it's available at the DOR website. So you can actually apply online. Um, you can call the DOR and ask for an application to be sent to you by mail or you can go to your local DOR office and fill out an application. As I mentioned earlier, we recommend that you call ahead so they can be prepared for your visit. Um, uh, in whatever way that you complete the application, we recommend that you sign and date the application and keep a copy for your records. That way you, you have a record of the date that you applied for services. Another good idea is to send it to the DOR in a way that you can verify the date that it was sent. So if you're sending it by fax, keep a fax confirmation sheet. Um, if you are sending it by mail, you may want to send it certified mail. If you deliver it in person, you can ask um, the front desk to date stamp a copy of the application for you to keep. I'm going to um, again go back to our chat box and, and ask folks if you have any questions about um, eligibility or application for DOR services. Well, while you're looking there, I just wanted to piggyback. One of the services that DOR offers is what's called on-the-job training, mm -hmm. which what they will do is they will actually help fund an internship or, you know, employment such that the company that's trying to hire that you want to work for eventually if they intend on hiring you and they just kind of want to see how it's going uh, test you out a little bit have you test out whether it's a good fit uh, DOR will actually fund that kind of a program so if if you knew of a place you wanted to work and they're tight on money and 
but you think you you know might be able to go and get a full-time job there or a part-time job there in the future that's something that you can leverage to help you find employment so i just wanted to point out and also if you're not a, many of our members would like to be regional center clients and they're not regional center has a program called paid internship program which is um similar uh but department of rehab in general is fairly easy to secure assistance from compared to regional center yes i i would definitely agree that the eligibility criteria for dor is very broad it's um cross disability um and as i mentioned it's only those four criteria um so if you are someone who um has not been found eligible for regional center services um that in no way impacts your eligibility for department of rehabilitation and you can have dual um support from both regional center and department of rehab um, absolutely yes and um, generally the the regional center will refer you to department of rehabilitation um, as what they call a generic resource um, if you need help with employment services and both agencies can work together they have different types of services that they provide um, so you can, you know, get your agencies to team up and make sure that all of your needs are met. Um, the same with pre-employment transition services, the only rule is they can't both provide the same service at the same time. Um, so they need to work together to, to determine who's funding what and when. So does anybody have any questions for Rebecca on this topic? I don't see anything, Rebecca, so you may want to move right. on. <laughs> I hope that means I'm, I'm doing a good job and you're not all asleep at your computer. <laughs> um, so the, the DOR has what's called an Individualized Plan for Employment, or an IPE. Um, so it's similar in concept to the IPP you may have with the regional center or the IEP you may have with the school district, but it's a whole new acronym. So the IPE um, is a plan that's made for you. Um, it is a roadmap to the type of job that you want um, based on your goals and your disability needs. And throughout the vocational rehabilitation process, you have the right to what's called informed choice. And that means that the DOR at each step should help to provide you with the information that you need to make decisions about your employment goal, the types of services that you'll receive, and the service providers who will provide you those services. Um, and so informed choice means that you have enough information about the risks and benefits of different options to be able to make meaningful decisions about what you want. Um, the Department of Rehabilitation should also communicate with you in your preferred mode of communication. So for different people and um, people with different disability related needs that may look different. Um, also, if you need help with making decisions, um, the DOR has services to help people to support your decision making. So what goes in the IPE? The IPE should say on the first page what your employment goal is. Um, now, I like to talk with folks about not necessarily the, the first job they want or the next job they want, but if you want to maximize the services you'll receive from the DOR, you may want to think about what is the job that I want to have five years from now, um, or what is the career that I'd like to retire from. Um, it's kind of hard to think about those things if you've never worked before. Um, so even if you get help with uh, finding your first job from the DOR, that doesn't mean that you can't reapply later on um, if you're looking for new employment or pursuing a different career. Your plan should also include the services that you need in order to reach your goal. 
Um, and sort of the when, who, how of uh, services. So when will you get the services? Who will provide them? And how will the DOR measure the progress that you're making towards your goal? It should also be clear about what the DOR's responsibilities are in the plan and what your responsibilities are. And we talked about post-employment services earlier. Um, the plan can also include any anticipated post-employment services that you might need. Um, so Judy mentioned earlier some of the, the services that the DOR provides like on the job training. I'm going to quickly go over the different types of services that uh, people receive from the DOR. So first is assessments to see if you're eligible or to find out what types of services they need. Um, an example of services of assessments to help find out what services you need could include an assistive technology assessment, um, a worksite assessment, um, or other assessments that recommend different types of um, equipment, services, or tools um, that you might benefit from as a student um, when looking for work or uh, in your employment. The DOR can also provide counseling, guidance, and referral. So that's the information and the relationship that you have with your vocational rehabilitation counselor. Um, where they provide you what you need to make informed decisions um, and refer you to other agencies and programs um, if there's a particular need that they can't meet or if you're eligible for something um, like a comparable benefit so you could get a free service um, elsewhere. They provide services to help people remove barriers to employment. Um, these are called restorative services. Um, so an example of a physical restoration service that is very common is eyeglasses. Um, so the DOR can assist with um, uh, basic uh, devices like that. Um, so it's any one-time purchase that removes a, a barrier to employment. Some of the more complex um, physical restoration services, um, and I'll tell a little story about a client. Um, I had a client who was a double congenital amputee, which means that um, she was absent both legs at birth, uh, who was working as a ranch hand um, in taking care of horses in exchange for um, food and shelter um, on a ranch. Um, and so her employment goal was to become a horse trainer, um, but she didn't have any medical insurance. And um, the prosthetic legs that she was using um, were very old and pieced together um, from lots of extra parts and weren't really meeting her needs and actually were, were causing her quite a bit of pain. Um, so we uh, approached the DOR because um, initially they had said, we don't think that um, you can become a horse trainer given your disability. And so um, my office helped her to advocate for the DOR to include um, uh, her goal in her plan. And the way that we did that is we asked for a medical evaluation and a recommendation about prosthetics that she might be able to use um, as a horse trainer. And so um, she went through the assessment, she had the assessment done, and um, they recommended some very specialized prosthetics that would allow her to do things like climb fences, jump right horses, and all kinds of other activities that are required um, for horse trainers. Um, so we, we used the assessment to ask the DOR to purchase the prosthetics, and they did. Um, and they also uh, supported her in her employment goal of becoming a horse trainer. And she did become a horse trainer. So um, not only is this a great example of services that are available, but um, you know, my encouragement to you to don't take the first no as the final no. There, there's um, lots of times where uh, there's opportunities to um, move past that with self-advocacy and assistance from folks um, like the ones that my office. Um, the DOR also provides training services, um, which can be uh, you know something like a a one-time class to improve computer skills, um, all the way up to, I've had clients who are doctors and lawyers, 
and uh, you know other um, very lengthy training paths. Um, you know, for getting uh, not only assistance with obtaining an associate's, bachelor's, or or advanced degree. Um, the Linda DOR provides training services. They typically provide it at the, the lowest cost option, which is usually a path of community college to public or your university, um, and then if necessary for the employment goal, um, another public university following. Um, they will fund up to the level of training that is needed for that particular job. Um, so some jobs uh, require a bachelor's degree, some require an associate's degree, um, some don't require any training at all. Um, and so it depends on what your, your goal is, but there are a couple exceptions. We have a fact sheet on our website um, that outline the, the four exceptions when the DOR may be able to fund a private school um, when that's appropriate uh, for a particular individual. Um, the DOR um, also can provide extra expenses for training or job search. These are called maintenance services. Um, and an example might be if someone is traveling for an interview um, or to go to school and they need to stay overnight or take a train or an airplane, the DOR can uh, assist with those additional costs. Um, the DOR also provides transportation services. So generally, this is done in the form of a check, um, not the actual transportation. Um, so the, the default is that they will fund the, the lowest cost, which is usually um, a bus pass. Um, but for individuals who um, can't take uh, public transportation, either because routes are not available um, or for a disability-related reason, the DOR can provide um, a mileage rate um, if someone's driving their own car or being driven. Um, and in some circumstances, uh, the DOR can also fund um, the purchase and modification of a vehicle if someone um, needs to be able to drive, uh, but is not able to drive a um, non-adapted vehicle. Um, the DOR can also provide services to family members. Um, this is any... Um, a, family member service that helps the client, so the individual with a disability, to be able to access another service or reach their employment goal. Most common family member services that I see are benefits counseling and childcare. Um, and then the, the next one, interpreters, readers, and orientation and mobility services for individuals who are blind. So that was pretty straightforward, um, although I do want to note that DOR has a um, orientation and mobility center in Sacramento um, where um, people can go who are adjusting to vision loss um, and learn all kinds of independent and vocational skills. Um, they also provide job-related services. Um, so these are the services that help people to obtain employment or do their job search. And there's a pretty broad array of different types of ways the DOR helps people um, to find employment. Uh, some people uh, just need a little bit of help with their resume and practicing interviewing skills. Um, they may work with a job developer to do that. Other people um, you know, may receive what's called direct placement. Um, so if you're someone who has a hard time going through the, the front door, the regular application process for a job, um, the job developer that you work with um, might actually be working kind of like a, a, um, a headhunter, someone who's marketing you to employers. So, um, you know, they may call an employer and say, um, you know, I noticed you have this position. I work with Rebecca. She's got all these great skills and I think she'd be a match for you. You know, I'd like to introduce you to her. Um, and so they're helping me with um, actually um, moving through the application process and getting to meet an employer. Um, the next one on this slide is supported employment services. So these are services that people um, would receive after they have found employment. So any service that's provided on the job. The most common supported employment service um, that I see is um, job coaching. 
Um, so the DOR can provide the initial funding for a job coach, um, which means they would fund it up to 24 months, but there is an exception for longer um, if it's needed. And the goal is that they would start with whatever level the person needs. And once that person is um, only receiving 20% of intervention or the, the dog coach is only helping that person 20% of their day, um, then the, the funding of the service would transfer to another funder. Most of the time this is the regional center, but I've also seen some creative arrangement of work incentive programs to pick up the funding for non-regional center clients as well. Um, so there are many more services. Um, Judy talked about on-the-job training. Um, on-the-job training is where the DOR pays up to $5,000 in someone's um, wages as a reimbursement to the employer while that person is learning the job. So it's a great way to um, incentivize for the employer that it's a, you know, it's a good idea to hire Rebecca because while she's learning, we're getting reimbursed for the cost of her, um, her salary or her hourly rate. Um, and it's great for me because it's an opportunity to learn a new job. Um, the DOR can also provide customized employment. Customized employment, um, okay. Customized employment um, is fantastic for folks who, uh, you know, would not be necessarily as successful with the direct placement model that I talked about. Um, so uh, this is a, an opportunity for folks who, um, you know, find that they don't fit uh, every job description, um, but they fit really well with some parts of a particular job, but maybe not so well with other parts, um, to ask for customized employment services. Um, the way this service works is that a job developer would get to know me, get to know my interests, my strengths, um, what am I good at? What do I need support with? What things do I like? What things do I not like? Um, what are things that I can learn? Um, and with all that information that they collect through a process called discovery, they make recommendations to the DOR about what types of services I may need for employment. And then I receive those services um, and I get ready to work. And then Um, once I'm to work, the job developer um, is calling and marketing me to employers in order to create a position that's tailor-made for me. Um, so uh, an example is I, I had a client who wanted to work in an office, um, and there are lots of things in offices that she is just really good at. So um, she's great at filing, she does very well with data entry, um, but she would prefer not to do things that typically come up in like an, an administrative or receptionist position, um, like answering the phone or sitting at a front desk. So um, the job developer um, reached out to several offices and created a, a mutually beneficial relationship for my client and an employer. So my client um, was offered to the employer with all of her strengths and the things that she's good at, you know, to build a position around her. The benefit the employer um, received is once all those um, talents that she has were, were designated to a particular position, it freed up a lot of resources for the administrative staff and the receptionist to take on other um, responsibilities in the office. Um, so not only was it a great fit for my client and she got to work and, you know, her new job, um, but it was also a benefit to the employer's bottom line because she made the office more efficient. Um, the DOR can also provide what's called personal assistance services. So these are services that help um, individuals uh, with disabilities to perform tasks that um, someone without a disability um, could do, you know, generally independently. Um, so, for example, eating lunch, um, getting dressed for work, uh, using the restroom, turning pages, so these types 
of, of tabs. Um, and the personal assistant is a support um, person, uh, either in the context of training or on the job. Um, services to help you keep your job. Um, this is a broad category called employment retention services, and this could include any of the types of services that we talked about uh, for the purpose of stabilizing employment. Um, licensed tools, equipment, initial stock, and supplies. Um, so this comes up generally in two different scenarios. So one is for someone who's starting their own business. Um, and needs help with the initial startup costs. The other is for people who work um, in a job where they need certain tools or equipment that are required but not paid for by the employer. Um, so an example is I had a client who um, was working as a mechanic. He obtained a job. Um, but the, you know, when you work as a mechanic, the employer doesn't provide you with a toolbox full of tools. You have to pay for those yourself. Um, and they can be pretty costly. Um, so in that case, we negotiated and um, uh, asked the DUR to fund the cost of his tools and equipment um, so that he could uh, obtain the position. Um, the DOR can also provide technology devices and training, including assistive technologies. Um, Pre-employment transition services, which we discussed earlier, and they provide guidance um, for people who are looking to start their own small business or are interested in telecommuting. And then the last category of services um, is called other goods and services. And so uh, if you have a need um, in order to reach your employment goal and it's not something I've talked about yet, it may fall under the category of other goods and services um, because that covers other things that you need in order to reach your employment goal. So I'm going to pause here again and, and just um, open up the chat box to see if anybody has any questions about um, the services that I just mentioned. Right. I mean, we don't see any questions, so um, I'm going to go to the next slide. So um, we're towards the end of the training. So these are some common um, issues or, or things that come up um, for folks who contact our office. Um, so people call us if they're seeking information about services um, or supported employment if they're um, trying to access transition services from the DOR. We also receive calls from people who work in sub-minimum wage or segregated work settings who want to work in competitive integrated employment. Um, people who are experiencing delays or denials um, related to their eligibility for services. Um, people who have disagreements about assessments or assessment planning. Uh, people who are in the process of developing an individualized plan for employment and they have questions or they disagree um, with the DOR about their goals, services, or service providers. Um, people who have the, oops, sorry, people who are experiencing um, a delay or a denial in their employment goal or they need an accommodation from the DOR. Um, we also received dis uh, calls about disputes about comparable benefits, um, and these typically look like, some, you know, for example, someone who receives services from more than one agency, and the agencies are not in agreement about who should pay for what services and when. Um, we also received calls from people whose case is closed, and they disagree about the reason that the case is closed or that it should be closed at all. Um, so lastly, I want to share with you our, our intake line um, and our website. So our intake line is 800-776-5746. And our website is www.disabilityrightsca.org. And on this slide is a picture of our logo on a page with braille print uh, and someone uh, four fingers um, reading the braille. 
And very quickly, I'm going to try to give you a tour of our website. And if you have questions um, in the interim, please feel free to, to share those in the chat box. So I can see the website on my screen. Can you see it as well? Uh, yeah, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, great. So this is our, our home page. Um, we have a special page here um, with all of our COVID-19 resources. Um, and so on the left side of the page, you can see different um, categories. So if you have questions about um, education or special education um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, you can find those here. Housing, mental health, reasonable accommodations, um, and many other topics. We do have some um, sample letters related to employment under our reasonable accommodations tab. So um, if you are working or returning to work um, and you have concerns about um, your needs on the work site or you need accommodations, um, we have three sample letters uh, that you can download. Um, one is related to um, just generally asking for COVID-19 related reasonable accommodations. Um, one is a request to work from home. And the last one is if you cannot work, um, a sample letter to help you request paid leave um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm going to go back to our home page by clicking the logo and share with you here our self-advocacy resources. And I have a note here to um, also let you know about our benefits and special education resources and where to find them. And so this would be the page. We have all of our self-advocacy publications here by topic. for Department of Rehabilitation is here. We have employment, um, in-home support services, Medi-Cal, mental health. Um, again, we really try to cover the full range of um, issues that someone with a disability might encounter. So at the bottom, here's a link for all of our social security and work publications. Um, this link is specific to SSI. Um, and then below that is our two manuals. So um, we have one large manual about special education rights and responsibilities. We have another large manual about your rights under the Lannerman Act, um, which is the law that governs regional center services. So since the question came up, I'm gonna share our special education manual. Um, and so it's a larger publication that is divided by chapter. So um, here you can see in the links the different topics that are discussed. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and click on Chapter 3 for eligibility. Um, we do our best to uh, draft all of our publications um, at between the 6th and 8th grade reading level. Um, there was a question earlier, and I'm going to see if I can find it now. Oh, I asked it. It was, it was um, not a, in the chat. It was about a family that has a, a child who's um, going to be a junior in high school. He's in honors. He's, he's got autism. He's in honors classes, has Tourette's, and they're not um, allowing him to be serviced through an IEP. Right, so I'm, I'm not going to give legal advice today, but I just want to point out, so um, this is a Q&A um, format, so there's a question here, can gifted students um, be denied special education for specific learning disabilities based solely on intelligence? Um, so this is uh, chapter three, question 19. Okay. And this is what our publication looks like, um, so you, you can find answers to questions here. Um, I also just want to share with you our um, events page. So I'm going to scroll down um, 
to the home page. And here under announcements is webinars. So if you'd like to attend one of our upcoming webinars, um, this is a list of uh, uh, where you will find those. Um, tomorrow we have a webinar on best practices for employers and businesses during COVID-19. Um, and then we have some upcoming uh, webinars about um, uh, social security disability insurance. And then we've been recording our past webinars um, and recently we did a training series on employment. Um, so we have uh, information about services to help you keep your job, employment services for people with disabilities, reasonable accommodations in the workplace, and employment benefits and social security. Um, uh, under this webinar, we also talk about how to apply for unemployment uh, insurance if your employment has been impacted or you've lost employment um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and thank you guys so much for having me. I hope you hung in there with all that information. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had a question for you, um, Rebecca. I noticed housing. One of the issues that we have is Section 8 housing. It's like a, the unicorn of benefits. <laughs> you know, it, it, my son applied 10 years ago, and we're still way down on the list. Do you work at all with Section 8, or can you provide any help with that? Um, so we assist with uh, disability-related legal issues. So our work with Section 8 housing is usually where that intersects with some type of disability discrimination. Um, but Section 8 itself is not um, a disability-specific program. It's an a income-based program. Um, okay. So some of the, the work we've done around Section 8 is my Section 8 housing is not accessible or I'm being evicted um, because of something I need for my disability um, or some other, dis there has to be a disability intersection. Okay. Are there any more questions for Rebecca? Give it a sec. Does DOR like support provide like tuition reimbursements for people, like community college and stuff? So the DOR can pay for um, tuition. Um, they will start services from the time that you and the DOR sign the IPE. Um, so typically, they're you know if you're just signing your IPE today. Um, they generally don't go backwards to reimburse for um, things that happened before the date was signed. Um, but uh, there are some exceptions to that. Um, I have had cases where my clients are seeking reimbursement for something they felt the DOR um, said that they would pay for and then didn't, or that they should have paid for um, at a particular time. Um, but didn't. And so if, if that um, is a, a concern that, that you have, you're welcome to contact our office and we can look, you know, look into your options in terms of a reimbursement claim. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Well, I guess we, we have the evening off. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, on you. Thursday, we have the uh, session on stress, so that's 7 o'clock on Thursday, and until then, everybody, take it easy. Be safe out there. Thank you.